Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Amit to him, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Alagadupa Sutta, because we're going to examine um, not just the part about arti, we're going to look at the similes. And it's sort of like this. I mean, I can tell you about things and as much as I want to, but if you don't hear them and read them for yourself, you're never going to believe it. <laughs> you know, but these, these uh, similes are all having to do with um, following instructions and not deviating from what is correct and staying with what is correct in order to have things operate the right way. In other, even the story of the raft. I mean, it's everything is that way. So we're going to do um, Majima Nikai number 22, Alagadupama Sutta, the simile of the snake. First comes the setting. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the blessed one was living in Sawati in Jetis Grove and at the Pindictus Park. Now on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in the bhikkhu named Arata, formerly of the vulture killers. Thus, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the blessed one, those things called obstructions by the blessed one are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. Now several bhikkhus having heard about this, they went to the bhikkhu Arata and asked him, friend Arata, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? Now they were concerned because he was, he'd been a monk for a while and there are other monks coming and just beginning to learn and he's talking to a lot of them and they were getting upset because he was telling them something that was wrong. And they got so upset that you listened to what happened. Exactly so, friends, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. And then these bhikkhus, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus, Friend Arata, do not say so, they said. Do not rep misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus, for in many ways the Blessed One has stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. The Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of the skeleton, with the simile of the piece of meat, with the simile of the grass torch, with the simile of the pit of coals, with the simile of a, the dream, with the simile of the borrowed goods, with the simile of fruits on a tree, and with the simile of a butcher's knife and block, and with the simile of the sword stake, and with the simile of the snake's head. The Blessed One has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification, much suffering and despair and that the danger in them is still more. Yet, although pressed and questions and cross-questioned by those bhikkhus in this way, the bhikkhu arata, formerly of the vulture killers, still obstinately adhered to his pernicious view and continued to insist on it. Since the bhikkhus were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, they sat down on one side and told him all that had occurred, adding 
Venerable sir, since we could not detach a bhikkhu Arata, formerly of the vulture killers from his pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the blessed one. So then the blessed one addressed a certain bhikkhu thus, Come, Bhikkhu, and tell the Bhikkhu Arata, formerly of the vulture killers, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, Venerable Sir, he replied, and he went to the Bhikkhu Arata and told him, the teacher calls you friend Arata. Yes, friend, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Arata, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct you who, when you engage in them. Exactly so, Venerable Sir, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct, I'm sorry, by the Blessed One, those things called obstructions by the Blessed One are not able to obstruct one who engages in them. This is a big oops, <laughs> really big one. Misguided man to have to teach the Dom in that way. Man. I have daily sexual pleasures provide little gratification and much suffering and despair and that the danger in them is still more and I have given you many sim similes as well you can flip the page because I'm not going to read them all again but it's the same list okay I have stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification much suffering and despair and that the danger in them is still more. And yet you, misguided man, by your wrong grasp, have misrepresented us, injured yourself, and stored up much demerit. For this will lead to your harm and suffering for a very long time. And then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, what do you think? Has this bhikkhu arata, formerly of the vulture killers, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this dhamma and discipline? How could he, venerable sir? No, venerable sir. When this was said, the bhikkhu arata, formerly of the vulture killers, sat silent, dismayed, his shoulders drooping, his head down, glum, and without response. And then knowing this, the blessed one told him, misguided man, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. I shall question the bhikkhus on this matter. And he has to do this because he, it, this is actually a, a moving uh, meditation school that's moving around and he has to keep the teaching straight and consistent and never let it become what he called a patchwork in another, uh, another sutta where he's talking to another teacher. So it cannot be a patchwork. It has to be very clear, succinct, and all connected together. And then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me as this bhikkhu Arata, formerly of the vulture killers, does when by his wrong grasp, he rep misrepresents us and injures himself and stores up much demerit? No, venerable sir, for in many ways, this blessed one has stated how obstructive things are obstructions, how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. And the blessed one has stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification much suffering and despair, and that the danger in them is still more. With the simile of the skeleton and the simile of the snake's head and the other similes, the Blessed One has stated this, that this danger 
in them is still more. Good, bhikkhus. It is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus. For in many ways I have stated how obstructive things are obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. I have stated that sensual pleasures provide little gratification and much suffering and despair and that the danger in them is still more. And then he mentions the other similes again. I have stated that there is danger in them and still more, but this bhikkhu arata, formerly of the vulture killers, by his wrong grasp misrepresents us. He injures himself and he stores up much demerit for this will lead to his misguided man's harm and suffering for a long time. Bhikkhus, that one can engage in sensual pleasures without sensual desires, without perceptions of sensual desire, without thoughts of sensual desire, that is impossible. He now explains the simile of the snake. Here, bhikkhus, some misguided men, they learn the Dhamma discourses, stanzas, expositions, verses, exclamations, sayings, the birth stories and the marvels and answers to questions. But having learned the Dhamma, they do not examine the meaning of these teachings with wisdom, not examining the meaning of these teachings with wisdom, they do not gain a reflective acceptance of them. Instead, they learn the Dhamma only for the sake of criticizing others and for winning in debates. And they do not experience the good for the sake of which they learned the Dhamma. And those teachings being wrongly grasped by them conduce to their harm and suffering for a long time. And why is that? Because of the wrong grasp of the teachings. Suppose a man needing a snake, seeking a snake, wandering in search of a snake, saw a large snake and grasped its coils by its tail. It would turn back on him and bite his hand or it would climb his arm or one of his limbs and because of that, he would come to death or deadly suffering. And why is that? Because of his wrong grasp of the snake. So too, here some misguided men learn the Dhamma. And why is that that they get confused? Because of their wrong grasp of the teachings, that is why. Here, bhikkhus, some clansmen learn the Dhamma, discourses, and they have answers and questions. Questions have the Dhamma, examine the meaning and the teachings. If each time they say, with wisdom, if you know the teaching, that he's attempting to teach where you can understand the uh, origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape concerning all arising phenomena in the mind, okay? And so whenever you see this wisdom, you know that they need to run this by the seven links that we show you in dependent origination to see if they know them well enough to look and look at that angle of how everything is working, everything that's happening. Examining the meaning of the teachings with wisdom, they gain a reflective acceptance of them. They do not learn the Dhamma for the sake of criticizing others for winning debates. And they experience the good for the sake of which they learned the Dhamma. And those teachings being rightly grasped by them conduce to their welfare and happiness for a long time. And why is that? snake and saw a large snake and he caught it rightly with a cleft stick, a stick like this on the end. Saw a large snake 
and caught it rightly with a cleft stick. And having done so, he grasped it tightly around the neck. And then although the snake might wrap his coils around the man's hand, or it could wrap his, around his arm or his limbs, still he would not come to death and deadly suffering because of that. And why is that? Well, because of his right grasp of the snake. So too, here some clansmen learn the Dhamma. And why is that? Because of their right grasp of those teachings, they benefit from it. And therefore, bhikkhus, when you understand the meaning of my statements, remember it accordingly. And when you do not understand the meaning of my statements, then ask either me about it or those bhikkhus who are wise. Run away and ask Sariputta. Go find Kohito. All those folks. Find the intervals and they'll tell you exactly what it meant. Now the simile of the raft. Bhikkhus, I shall show you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft, being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied, and the blessed one said this. Bhikkhus, suppose a man in the course of a journey saw a great expanse of water whose near shore was dangerous and fearful and whose further shore was safe and would be free from fear. But there was no ferry boat or bridge for going to the far shore. And then he thought, there is this great expanse of water whose near shore is dangerous and fearful, whose further shore is safe and free from fear. But there is no ferry boat or bridge for going to the far shore. So suppose this, suppose I collect grass, twigs, branches, and leaves, bind them together into a raft and support, supported by this raft and making an effort with my hands and my feet, I got safely across to the far shore. And then the man collected the grass, the twigs, the branches and leaves and bound them together into a raft supported by that raft and making an effort with his hands and feet. He got safely across to the far shore. And then when he had got across and had arrived at the far shore, he might think thus, this, uh, this raft has been very helpful to me. And since supported by it and making an effort with my hands and feet, I got safely across to the far shore. Suppose I were to hoist it on my head and load it on my shoulder and then go wherever I want. Now, bhikkhus, what do you think? By doing this, would that man be doing what should be done with that raft? No, venerable sir. By doing what that man be doing should be done with, this, with that raft. What should be done with that raft? Here, bhikkhus, when the man got across and he had arrived at the far shore, he might think thus, this raft has been very helpful to me and since it supported me, and making an effort with my hands and feet was successful. I got safely across to the far shore. So suppose I, I were to haul it onto dry land and set it adrift or set it to drift in the water, and then I would go wherever I want. Now, bhikkhus, it is by doing so that the man would be doing what should be done with the raft. So I have shown you how the Dhamma is similar to a raft and being for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping and holding on to. Because when you know the Dhamma to be similar to a raft, you should abandon even the teachings and how much more so things that are contrary to the teachings. I'm going to take you to a note. Uh, I'm going to 
take you to 255 if you want to follow along, if you have it. And it's a really good note to bring this in. I remember God did that one time too. And um, it's nice because of what it's about. Now it says basically, the MA interprets the, the Dhamma Pivo Pahatava Pageva Adama. The word Dhamma is ambiguous here. And MA interprets it as meaning good states. That's what it means here. It doesn't just mean teaching, it means good states he's talking about. And so, which it identifies uh, with serenity and insight. Now see, this is serenity and insight together. Thus, in, in its paraphrase of the text, I teach bhikkhus even the abandoning of desire and attachment to such peaceful and sublime states as the serenity and insight, how much more so to that low and vulgar, contemptible and coarse and impure thing that this foolish Arata sees as harmless when he says that there is no obstruction in desire and lust for the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, the commentator also cites a couple of suttas here that are interesting. And I suggest that you take a look at them yourselves. He cites 66 dot 26 to 33, the verses 26 to 33, as an example of the Buddha teaching the abandonment of attachment to serenity. And this is very interesting that this is in here. I'll tell you why in a minute. And he also quoted um, Majima Nikai number 38, verse 14, as an example of his teaching the abandonment of attachment to insight. Now, it's interesting to me because we looked at the history line and I've talked to several about the world meditators then. And we were trying, I, I was trying to figure out what happened. When did the practice become separated into two other practices instead of one with practice with two components? And here it is in the text um, that the Buddha was actually um, talking about the balance that's necessary for these. So he notes that in each case, it is the attachment to the good states that should be abandoned, not the good states themselves. Now that's an important point. Let me say it again. The Buddha was teaching in each case, whether it's about serenity or insight, it is the attachment to the good states that should be abandoned, but not the good states themselves. This is where we are confused today. And we have students come to us and they say, uh, you know, I think I told you the story about the, the uh, woman that paid, played the cello. Okay. And she was a second a chair cello in a symphony orchestra in London. And some teachers had told her once to stop playing the cello because she's now a Buddhist. She shouldn't play the cello. She'll be too attached to it. Now you see, the thing is, she's not really attached to this is her gift. She's developed her talent. She should play the cello, but she shouldn't have it take over her life completely and not have any space for anything else in her mind, which would be the clinging of playing the cello. So it isn't, we have some confusion when people say, well, I'm a Buddhist. Well, now I have to only do silent retreats. I can't have any noise at all. I can't have any wind, any sound, any squeaking on the floor or a door creaking if it closes. There's something wrong here because we're not letting go of things and saying it's just sound or it's too much light, it's too little light, it's too hot, it's too cold, you see? And what we're trying to talk about in the line of teaching is equanimity, okay? With disenchantment happening, uh, very good collectedness and then disenchantment and then dispassion and then imperturbability. The higher the attainment goes or the deeper the attainment goes. 
the more strength happens in the equanimity. So all of these are interesting, but I thought this was worth your time to look it up and take a look at it because he quoted it. Despite what the commentator says, it seems to me that Dhamma here signifies not good uh, states themselves, but the teachings. The uh, correct attitude to which was delineated just above in the simile of the snake. The simile of the raft it, it, it in, uh, intimates that uh, each, even the teachings uh, that are to be rightly grasped must finally be relinquished. So when a person reaches uh, the attainments, they shouldn't necessarily let them take over everything entirely in your life, you see, unless you've decided to go on that track of the monastic. But you have to be very careful as lay people not to cut your family completely out of the picture, especially if you have children. A husband and wife making an agreement to go forth and see how far they can go in life. That's a different thing. Having the children involved to uh, meditate. We also encourage this in the States and it's very productive if you start from a very young age to have them join the family when you're sitting in meditation, not making them do it. See how long they can stay with you. So what is the contrary to the teachings is called Adama and would include moral laxity that the bhikkhu Arata advocated. And he was pointing, he was talking in, in relationships with relationships builders or things like that and that sort of thing and that's it's not okay when you're doing the development phase of your practice and coming up okay that's a very very interesting one um, that is there the next part of the sutta is standpoints for views because there are six standpoints for views which are the six here bhikkhus an untaught ordinary person who has no regard for noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma who has no regard for true men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their dhamma regards material form thus this is mine this i am this is myself he regards feeling thus this is mine this i am this is myself he regards perception thus this is mine this i am this is myself he regards formations thus this is mine this i am this is myself he regards what is seen heard sensed cognized encountered, sought, mentally pondered upon. This is mine, this I am, this is myself. And this standpoint of views, namely that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure for the true men and is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma regards material form thus this is not mine this i am not this is not myself he regards feeling thus this is not mine this i am not this is not myself and he regards perception thus this is not mine this i am not this is not myself. He regards formations thus. Formations are thoughts. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And he regards what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, sought, mentally pondered upon. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. And this standpoint four views, namely that which is the self, is the world, and after death I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, 
not subject to change, I shall endure as long as eternity, this too, he regards thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And since he regards them thus, he is not agitated by what is non-existent. It's really interesting. Since he lets it all go and takes everything impersonally, he is not agitated and irritated about what is not existent. Now we look at the agitation itself. When this was said, a certain bhikkhu asked the blessed one, venerable sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent externally? There can be, Bhikkhu, the, the, the blessed one said. Here, Bhikkhu, someone thinks thus. Alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it in the future. Alas, I do not get it. <laughs> then he sorrows, grieves, and laments weeps beating one's breast and becomes distraught. And this is how there is agitation about what is non-existent externally. Did you ever spend time really wanting something or planning so completely it's going to be this way and you get caught in the projection that you've set up the idea and then it all comes crashing down. You know, I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> I came back here from Goa and they told me this was ready to move into. Actually, there was a lot to do, okay? But it's okay, it worked out. And here we go, venerable sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent externally? <clears throat> there can be, Bhikkhu. The blessed one said, here Bhikkhu, someone does not think thus. Alas, I had it. Alas, I have it no longer. Alas, may I have it. Alas, I do not get it. And then he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament. He does not weep, beating his breast and become distraught. And that is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent externally. Venerable sir, can there be agitation about what is non-existent internally. There can be, Bhikkhu, the Blessed One said. Here, a Bhikkhu, someone has the view. That which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. He hears the Tathagata, or a disciple of the Tathagata, teaching in the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints, all decisions, all obsessions, all adherences, where you stick to your ideas, just let it go, and underlying tendencies for the stilling of all formations, stilling of all thoughts. They stop coming up. If we don't pay attention, they stop and they, they come away. For the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for Nibbana. He thinks thus, so I shall be annihilated. So I shall perish. So I shall be no more. And then, because of that thinking, he sorrows, he grieves and laments. He weeps, beating his breast and becomes distraught. And that is how there is agitation about what is non-existent internally. And venerable sir, can there be no agitation about what is non-existent internally? Or there can be, Bhikkhu, the blessed one said. Here, Bhikkhu, someone does not have the view. Now, this is the perspective. That which is self is the world. I it shall endure as long as eternity. And he hears the Tathagata, or a disciple of the Tathagata, 
teaching the Dhamma for the elimination of all standpoints. This is what you're letting go of. All your standpoints, all your decisions, your obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies for the stealing of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for decision, for decision, for Nibbana. He does not think thus. So I shall be annihilated. So I shall perish. So I shall be no more. And then he does not sorrow, grieve, and lament, and he does not weep, beating his breast and become distraught, because that is how there is no agitation about what is non-existent internally. So these are all your internal positions, politics, ideas. I mean, everything is listed here, everything. And if we are giving up all of those things, your standpoints and views, decisions, the past obsessions, you're opening the way to possibilities. You know, a long time ago, before I was Buddhist, I used to wonder, there must be people in the world who take the position, something is wrong if we close the door on new possibilities, you see? And that's what's, that's, what's hap that's what's happened in the past in, in countries that have been dictated or by oligarchs or things like that. People were not allowed to think beyond, beyond the, uh, what they were living with and that's all. I had a friend who grew up in East Germany and uh, he was actually a, a, you know, a um, Kaimita helping us. And he grew up in Germany and was one of Bonte's students. And he talked to me once about growing up and they used to play around a stream and go on their bikes around a stream in the countryside like Terry's picture here, you know, but the country was all poisoned. All the ground was poisoned with chemicals. They couldn't have horses or cattle or anything by the time the wall came down. People, I knew people that went back to see their properties that had been taken by the government. And when they went back to see if they could take their horses back to their family home, the family home had been divided into apartments for the people. And when they tested the ground in the pasture, it would have taken seven to 10 years to get uh, to treat the earth long enough to get grass that was edible for the horses. That's how bad it was. But when he played on his bike, he was going along the stream in the city, he was going along the stream. And the streams were the color of purple milk. And I'm there, well, we see this a little bit here and there in the cities, you know, in India. But do you know, an interesting thing about it was all that you have to do to clean the stream is for us to leave. And so during COVID, someone told me here in Mumbai, there were fish coming back into the canals. And they say the fish were coming back into the canals because all of a sudden it had gotten enough lockdowns that they started to begin to get clean. No one was dumping the way they were before into the canals. It was amazing. So these are the things, your perceptions and you, and he's not bitter anymore. He's left this all forgiven everything and very, very clear person now with his practice. But in the beginning, he was very bitter, very angry about having to grow up in a place where um, nothing was, uh, Nothing was whole. The cars were wooden and the buildings are falling apart from World War II. And this is a really sad situation. But now they're coming around to pulling things together much better. It's been a number of years. We now look at the impermanence and not self. Because you may well acquire that possession that is permanent everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. But do you see any such possession like that, bhikkhus, anywhere? No, venerable sir. Good, bhikkhus. I, too, do not see any possession that is permanent, everlasting, eternal, not subject to change, and that might endure as long as eternity. Because you may dwell, you may well cling to that doctrine of self, 
that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. But do you see any such doctrine of self, Bhikkhus? No, venerable sir. Do not see self. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who clings to it. Because you may well take as support that view that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. But do you see any such support of views? Bhikkhus? No, Venerable Sir. Good, Bhikkhus. Good. I, too, do not see any support of views that would not arouse sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair in one who takes it as a support. Bhikkhus, there being a self, would there be for me what belongs to the self? Yes, Venerable Sir. Or there being what belongs to the self, would there be for me a self? Yes, venerable sir. Because since a self and what belongs to a self are not apprehended as true and established than this standpoint of views, namely that which is the self is the world. After death, I shall be permanent, everlasting, eternal, and not subject to change. I shall endure as long as eternity. Would it not be an utterly and completely foolish teaching? What else could it be, venerable sir, but an utterly and completely foolish teaching? Because what do you think? Is material form permanent or impermanent? impermanent venerable sir is what is impermanent suffering or happiness suffering venerable sir is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus this is mine this i am this is myself no venerable sir because what do you think is feeling Oh, this is going to be fun. Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, venerable sir. Is perception or formations or consciousness? Permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Suffering, venerable sir. Is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am. This is myself. No, venerable sir. Therefore, bhikkhus, any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all material form should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Any kind of feeling, whatever, any kind of perception, whatever, any kind of formations, whatever, any kind of consciousness, whatever, whether it is past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all consciousness should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Seeing thus, Bhikkhus, a well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with material form, disenchanted with feeling, 
disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with formations, disenchanted with consciousness. And being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate and through dispassion, his mind is liberated. And whether it is liberated, there, when it is liberated, it, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. What is the holy life? Holy life is the time that you put into developing your spiritual development. That's what the holy life is. And to what degree as lay people? To many different degrees. And to monastics, also many different degrees. And the arahant. Because this bhikkhu is called one who has, whose crossbar has been lifted, whose trench has been filled in. So you can't fall into a pit anymore and you're not carrying a bar on your back anymore. Whose pillar has been uprooted, uprooted all that needs to be taken away or let go of. One who has no bolt, a noble one, whose banner is lowered, identity's just not there. <laughs> whose burden is lowered and who is unfettered, uncaught, unbound. How is the bhikkhu, one whose crossbar has been lifted? The bhikkhu has abandoned ignorance, has cut it off at the root, made it like a palm stump, done away with it, so that it is no longer subject to future arising. That is how the bhikkhu is one whose crossbar has been lifted. And how is the bhikkhu one whose trench has been filled in? When the bhikkhu has abandoned the round of births that brings renewed being, has cut it off at the root so that it is no longer subject to any future arising. And that is how the bhikkhu is one whose trench has been filled. How is the bhikkhu one whose pillar has been uprooted? Here, the bhikkhu has abandoned craving. He has cut it off at the root so that it is no longer subject to any future arising. And that is how the bhikkhu is one whose pillar has been uprooted. And how is the bhikkhu one who has no bolt? Here, the bhikkhu has abandoned the five lower fetters, has cut them off at the root so that they are no longer subject to any future arising. And that is how the bhikkhu is one who has no bolt. And how is the bhikkhu a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered, who is unfettered, here the bhikkhu has abandoned the conceit I am and has cut it off at the root and so that it is no longer subject to future arising. And that is how the bhikkhu is a noble one whose banner is lowered, whose burden is lowered and who is unfettered. And bhikkhus, when the gods with Indra, with Brahma and Pajapati, Seek a bhikkhu who is thus liberated in mind. They do not find anything of which they could say. The consciousness of one thus gone is supported by this. And why is that? One thus gone, I say, is untraceable here and now. And everything that should be abandoned was a remainderless fading away and cessation of what should be let go. That was what was so important. Now we look at the misrepresentation of the Tathagata. So saying, Bhikkhu, so proclaiming, I have been baselessly, vainly, falsely, and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins. And thus the recluse Gotama is one who leads astray, teaches annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. As I am not, as I do not proclaim, 
so have I been baselessly, vainly, falsely, wrongly misrepresented mis, uh, by some recluses and Brahmins. And thus the recluse Godama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation of the, dis, the destruction and extermination of an existing being. They're very confused. They're very confused. Bhikkhus, both formally and now, what I teach is suffering and the cessation of suffering. If others abuse, revile, scold, and harass, delight, joy, elation in the heart. If others honor, respect, and revere and venerate the Tathagata for that, well, the Tathagata on that account thinks thus, they perform such services as, as these for me in regard to this, which earlier was fully understood. They have learned and the people help with the four requisites and help us with what we need, but we don't ask and we don't take pride in it and we don't, um, we're, we're not walking around with brag books. We say brag books with people sometimes, but it's not, it's not happening. That's not happening. Therefore, bhikkhus, if others abuse and revile and scold and harass you, on that account, you should not entertain any annoyance or bitterness or dejection of the heart. And if others honor, respect, revere, and revenerate, venerate you, on that account, you should not entertain any delight, joy, or elation of the heart. If others honor, respect, revere, and venerate you, on that account, you should think thus. They perform such services as these for us in regard to this which earlier was fully understood. Not yours. This is a section called not yours. Therefore, because whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. What is it that is not yours? Material form is not yours. Abandon it. And when you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Feeling is not yours. Abandon it. When you've abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Perception is not yours. Abandon it. And when you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a very long time. Informations are not yours. Abandon them. And when you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. And when you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. Bhikkhus, what do you think if people carried off the grass, sticks, branches, and leaves in this jetta growth or burned them or did what they liked with them? Would you think people are carrying us off or burning us or doing what they like with us? No, venerable sir, why not? Because that is neither our self nor what belongs to ourself. So too, bhikkhus, whatever is not yours, abandon it. And when you have abandoned it, it will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. What is it that is not yours? Material form is not yours. Feeling is not yours. Perception is not yours. Formations are not yours. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. In this Dhamma, because the Dhamma well proclaimed by me, thus is clear, it is open, evident, free from patchwork. In the Dhamma, it is well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. 
There is no future round for manifestation in the case of those bhikkhus who are arahants with taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done and laid down the burden. They've reached their goal, destroyed the fetters of being and are completely liberated through final knowledge here and now. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, free of patchwork. And if the Dhamma in the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear and free from patchwork, those bhikkhus who have abandoned the five lower fetters are due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there they will attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear and free of patchwork. And in the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who are turning once to this world to make an end of suffering. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear and free of patchwork. And in the Dhamma, well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear and free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who have abandoned three fetters are all stream enterers, no longer subject to perdition, bound for deliverance and headed for enlightenment. Because the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear and free of patchwork and in the Dhamma, well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear and free of patchwork, those bhikkhus who are Dhamma followers or the faith followers are all headed for enlightenment. Bhikkhus, the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork. And in the Dhamma well proclaimed by me thus, which is clear, open, evident, and free of patchwork, those who have sufficient faith in me, sufficient love for me, are all headed for heaven. That is what the Blessed One said, and the bhikkhus were satisfied. They were delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, also, let's see what time it is. What time is it? Do we have questions at this point? If we have questions, we can take some questions. Or I can show you um, a little bit of the um, other similes, but you can look them up yourself also. I think I gave you the page on them and they're all collected into one spot if you're curious about that, because I was 54. And when you go through them, you get the idea you need to follow instructions. But the big message in this whole sutta was, do not engage the hindrances. Do not feed them. Do not give them. You can't invite them. One person said, you know, I used to paint the picture of, I, I don't want to chase them away. I don't want to be mean to anybody. If they show up, I'll let them come in, sit down and have tea and cookies, but I'll let them know I haven't got time to speak with them. I need to sit in meditation and I'll go back to my meditation. So in my mind, I was like, okay, here you can come, but I'm not going to talk with you. I'm not going to socialize. It's a start. But the Buddha is being much more blunt. He's telling you, quote, unquote, the only way that an obstacle becomes an obstruction is when you personally engage it. And that's the law of the hindrances. You don't feed them nutriment. It'll mess you up and they'll keep coming back for more. Questions, anybody? I see Ardika, hi. I see a lot of people here now. That's good. Yeah, sister. <laughs> so, do you want to go anywhere with this? <laughs> There's not a whole lot we can talk about it, but if you have any questions about it, 
I can't believe everybody's wiped out. I got wiped out because of the sun today, but I can't believe everybody's wiped out. I have a question, Sister Kema. Yep. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, you read out those who have abandoned the three lower fetters. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the three lower fetters that, that are being referred to? Three lower fetters have to do with the uh, stream enterer. Yeah. The three lower fetters are basically, you know that all your doubt is gone about finding the practice. You know you have found the practice, okay? The second one is that you know it's clear to you after learning the uh, information as the Buddha was teaching it, it's clear that um, rites and rituals will not take you to Nibbana. Now notice that's what it, it's about. The, the fetter was believing that you have to keep doing rites and rituals to, to get uh, to Nibbana. It doesn't say don't go and spend your holidays and do the rites and rituals for holidays and ceremonies and celebrations. It doesn't say okay. that. Okay. So let's not get confused about this. It's just like in that one place it said, um, in, I think it was the, um, it was in the, uh, just because you don't grasp something doesn't mean you try not to feel at all. This is a good example of what's wrong right now. Um, and we met, that's not it. That's the wrong suit. I, I pointed it out to you in the If I, what I said, you know, you want to look at number two um, and read that through. It's um, here, here is saying to you, in each case, it is the attachment to the good states that should be abandoned. So what's that? Lust should be abandoned, but not the good states themselves. So this idea we have is a crooked thing, is an adama. When we say, don't allow joy to come up. If we ever hear that, we don't pay any attention to it because when joy comes up, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Nothing wrong with seeing something funny and laughing at it and going past it. And again, nothing wrong with feeling joy or elation that your daughter comes home with an A++ in chemistry or biochemistry. There's nothing wrong with this, you see? It's not wrong. The point was don't cling to it, crave and cling it. He's trying to define the, uh, the teaching. And people today, they go overboard. One guy, uh, one man, he was um, someone who helped us a lot, but he was confused about the Dhamma. And so when he was in a condominium, you know, a row house, the condos were hooked together. His front yard was the only yard that wasn't manicured and kept up. Because why? Because he thought, well, we can't kill anything. Now he's not a monk, he's a lay person. He's working in an office. And he's decided he's not going to ever cut the grass again. And everybody was upset with him. Well, I can't cut the flowers. I can't cut the vegetables in the vegetable garden. This is way overboard. You know, you are not a monk with 300 and some, uh, I'm sorry, 280 something rules that you're trying to follow. You're not a monk. You're a lay person. And there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, keeping your lawn neat and your house clean and all of this stuff, okay? Well, this is the same thing in here. BB wanted to make sure that he told you what the, the one commentarial writer had said. Um, there is no obstruction in, um, wait a minute, I'm sorry, wait a minute, where is it? Uh, in the case where there is an attachment that you're trying, he, he was trying to explain that the Buddha explained even giving, even, um, how do I put it? Giving up serenity practice, giving up insight practice. Why would you do that? Why? Well, because today people are, some of them get totally addicted to it. I mean, addicted to it. Not another person exists around them or anywhere else and they're totally hooked into it, but they're not monastics. 
if they want to be monastics, go be monastics. That's fine. But if you're you're so craving and clinging, one person wrote a note of I can't. Uh, what did it say? I can't make. I'm having so much trouble. I just can't make what happened three days ago happen again. <laughs> Every single sitting is different. Not one is duplicated from the previous one ever. You cannot repeat something again. Now, you can take a look in your diary when that happens. This is why diaries are so important. What were the conditions, do you think, what were the conditions that occurred that allowed you to fall into the level you experienced? This is important, yeah? And if you can see yourself clearly what those conditions were, then you can look at that in your meditation and check it out as you're meditating. Am I paying enough attention? Was the, let's see, uh, this is where your um, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom come in. This is where your, your uh, different parts of the 37 requisites of enlightenment, if, are you fulfilling all this stuff? So the conditions arise always the conditions arise that's something okay the buddha's method was not to try to make it happen at all so what this guy was suffering from this person was basically suffering from i want it to happen again that's a problem okay that's a problem and you have to not want anything. You have to sit down and simply sit to find out what happens next. That's why as a mom, I always tell you, this is going back to two years old. That two-year-old, when he plays, he just wanders around, checks out everything, really excited to discover everything, just to see what is next around the corner when he's walking around the yard, anything. They're wonderful, these little kids. They're building their dictionary and their encyclopedia. We, all, we already have one. That's our problem. <laughs> and we have to let go of comparing what's happening here in the present time with what happened before. Don't do that anymore. You're an explorer. And every time you sit down, you should be crossing a different glacier and discovering something new every time or a mountain or a hike, anything, you see? If you take that attitude, I'm an explorer and I'm just going to go see what happens next. And you don't try to ever repeat anything. Then you keep going down the path pretty steadily is what we find. And you increase your hours and you only thing you focus on is I need to leave the building. <laughs> I need to not be here anymore. The absence of me makes everything work. But if I'm there, I'm Inevitably, I want to control, I want to steer, I want to, you see? So it all, it's all hooked together like that. But the three of them were basically the doubt, the rites and rituals, no more rites and rituals, not believing anymore that rites and rituals can carry you to Nibbana. That's the correct way of saying it. And the third one is very clearly understanding atta and anatta. And that means understanding the, the, the um, impersonal nature clearly. But it doesn't mean that just because it, at the stream entry level, it doesn't mean that you're never going to break a precept again. You might, but just like that, you, you catch yourself and you take it again in your mind and forgive yourself and go on. You don't get hung up anymore, you see? It's really important. You, this deciphering atta and anatta is a very big step in supporting your practice. Because of what he was writing about when uh, in the sutta, when he was writing about how people were tearing him apart because he actually extinguishes human beings. They don't understand what the Buddha is teaching. He's extinguishing, 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 extinguishing things and telling you to abandon, 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 abandon. And they think that he was, some people got angry at him and then they would come and talk to him and he would straighten them out. Once they understood, we're not, we're not hurting anybody. We are not, um, we are not uh, 
executing anybody. We're just executing the, the idea of everything is me, it's mine, myself. Once you take that position, you take everything you see, hear, smell, taste, touch personally. Once you take it personally, what's happening, what you do in every aspect of life, when something happens, the next one is you blame yourself. It's got to be my fault. What just happened is my fault. Then when you start doing that, then you persecute yourself and then you fall into depression. And then this depression is happening to me because me is this big thing that's here. And just the idea of, and you have to look at it. If you're in another religion and you're attempting to be one with God, this is what I tell people is, okay, fine. But let's practice when we're doing this. Let's experiment with what if this is true? What would happen if I wasn't having to control everything and make this happen, what would it be like? That's why years ago I said, I came out of, after, <laughs> after meditating a long time, I came out and I said, you know what this is? You're asking us to experience an experience of no experience. <laughs> and that puts you in the right condition to fall into cessation. That's what was happening, see? <laughs> so, and, and after you work so hard, and you know, in, in some people in, in positions in uh, lockdown, when, um, what were the, all those things he was telling people they had to give up? What was it? I, I forget, mm, I don't know where it is, um, back here giving up your standpoints and your views and that big list of everything you have to give up. There's a lot of people that don't want to do that. That's me, my standpoints, my views, my political position, my decisions, the what I want to do. Do you hear that? I, I, I. So it's I, yay, yay, yay. <laughs> and then it's me, 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 me. That's what's happening. Me, 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 me. I thought we were in big trouble when we practiced for opera. Oh my. <laughs> Doing all our scares with me, 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 and I, 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 I. <laughs> so, but be having fun with this, you know? So now having fun with it and smiling with it and, and just experimenting with it to see where it goes. That was what was so good for you. That's what you need to try. Yeah. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they all protect Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.